Hi, my name is Hunter Lovins. I am the president of Natural Capitalism Solutions. Hi, my name is Hunter Lovins. I am the president of Natural Capitalism Solutions. We're having some technical difficulties, uh, among other things. Uh, Al Yanuzi is uh, on the East Coast and in the middle of uh, cleaning up from Hurricane Sandy, so bear with us for a few minutes. Okay, it appears that we're rolling. Natural Capitalism Solutions is a nonprofit that works with companies, communities, countries on ways to implement sustainability profitably. We're honored to be here with you today in this webinar on how do you tell your sustainability story. I'll be joined, I hope, by Al Iannuzzi from Johnson & Johnson, and I will be joined by Nick Astor, the founder of Triple Pundit, two people who have deep expertise in speaking about sustainability. It's important that you do talk about sustainability. Ogilvy did a study of the U.S. consumer market and found that green consumers are up to 80% of the market. Not all of them are what you might think of when you think of a green consumer, someone who is deep green. But all things equal, up to 82% of the market would prefer to buy a green product. Edelman found that purpose is driving consumer preference and loyalty in a world in which very few people trust companies, and in many cases, differentiation between brands is negligible. Now, bear with us, folks. Apparently, you are not seeing the slides that I'm advancing. So uh, stand by, and let's see if we can relaunch this. Okay, we're back. Uh, Havas Media found that basic levels of sustainability practices are the basic ante to be in the game. They're an entry level requirement. Havas also found, and, and for those of you who are representing companies, this, this should scare the tar out of you, most people in the world wouldn't care if up to 70% of brands went away. What they care about is whether the brand speaks to them. But only 28% think that companies are doing enough to tackle the really tough problems that we're facing in environment and social challenges. Cone Communications reiterated this, finding that there's a strong desire 
to see companies drive change. And they found this across over 10,000 customers surveyed in 10 of the 11 biggest world economies. With 93% of companies saying, 93% of customers saying that companies should go beyond legal compliance and that they must evolve their business practices to make their impact as positive as possible. Cohn found that 80% of Americans will switch brands if comparable in price to a company that supports a social cause that they care about. And this is particularly true when you look at the younger customer. Generation Y is looking for products that are made ethically, that are aligned with social causes. They're less concerned about buying a brand because it's cool, and they retain a lot of faith in brands and companies' ability to change the world. At the same time, well over half of customers aren't clear where they should get information about sustainability. Over half say they don't understand the impact that they're having when they buy a product from a company that is badging itself as more responsible. So it's up to people who are bringing a product to the market to speak to its sustainability cred, qualifications, attributes. So rule number one, talk about it. Don't be a zipper mouth. A number of companies have resisted talking about what they believe what their commitment to sustainability is, because they're afraid of being seen to be greenwashing or they're afraid of pushback. Adidas said before the London Olympics, they didn't talk about it. And they realized that their customers were having a hard time determining whether they did have a commitment to sustainability. Even though the company has a deep and long-standing commitment to it, seeing it as simply the right thing to do, not, not because they're trying to leverage their brand, but if they aren't talking about it, the customer doesn't know this. I had supper with the CEO of North American L'Oreal, and he said he was having a hard time finding good talent, even in a down economy when you would think people would be hungry to get a job. I then sat through a series of presentations by his people of all of the impressive things that L'Oreal was doing. Deep energy retrofits to a facility in Canada and then going 100% renewable. Facilities in Belgium that were biofueled. All of the, the authentic sustainability commitment. But when I prepared to go to the meeting and went on the web and looked for any story about L'Oreal and sustainability, there were none. The company was silent. Well, they're not anymore. And as a result, they are being rewarded for good reporting. They've uh, announced a cradle to cradle gold product line. They've entered the conversation. When you do enter the conversation, it is critically important that you be transparent, that you be authentic, that you tell the truth. It's very easy to call a product natural when natural really means nothing. To some extent, it's important that you enter the conversation in an authentic way before other people do. This is a website that anybody, anybody, can go on to and rate your company. You better be out there with your message before people who don't like you start setting up sites on glassdoor.com. However, it is, again, critically important that you tell the truth. This year, the Federal Trade Commission has entered the conversation, saying that although they've had 20-year guidelines, they are now taking a very strong look at green claims to be sure that customers that want to buy green are getting authentic green. 
they have listed a set of green commandments that companies should be clear, prominent, and understandable with any claims, qualifications, and disclosures. Specify in marketing whether the claim refers to the product, the packaging, a service, or just a piece of it. The claim should not overstate directly or by implication the environmental attribute. And comparative environmental marketing claims should be clear to avoid consumer confusion. This is pretty common sense stuff, but we see a lot of examples in which companies overreach. The FTC went after a window company that was claiming that its products were eco-friendly and that people who installed the windows could save up to 50% when in fact the, in, the way the windows were used customers were saving considerably less than that. Honesty, transparency, authenticity should be the watchwords. Talk about what you're doing well and what you could be doing better. Customers appreciate hearing from you that there are areas in which you can improve, that you know this, that you're working on it. Describe what it is that you're doing and invite your customers to participate in this conversation. If something's vexing you, ask for help. Customers love to be asked for help. It's real important though that you be doing what you say you're doing. BP found out to its dismay that despite its brilliant rebranding of itself away from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum, started to unravel when it became apparent that they were spending less than 1% of their revenue uh, from their renewables programs. And then of course the Deep Horizon spill in the Gulf. You don't own your brand. You may think you do, but in event of customers deciding that they don't like you, they can take it over. And after the BP spill, activists set up a fake Twitter site to spoof BP. The fake Twitter site had 190,000 followers compared to BP's real site, which only had 20,000. Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, said it best. If you have something you don't want anybody to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. The fourth rule, empower your people. I know many companies think that anything that emanates from the company should be cleared through PR, be cleared by the lawyers, be the official statement. Remember, almost all young workers want to be involved with a green company. The book, What Would Google Do? by the Business Week reporter Jeff Jarvis tells some compelling stories of companies that failed to engage in an authentic conversation with their customers and what this cost them. And then how some of them turned themselves around by opening up their communication, allowing their employees to blog the good and the bad and by asking their customers to get engaged in helping to improve the design, helping to improve the product, having an honest two-way conversation. One of the best companies in doing this that I've found is Adnams Brewery. CEO Andy Wood is committed to sustainable operations, everything from buying local and making his facilities as energy efficient, as renewable as possible. But perhaps the most impressive thing that he does is to encourage all of his employees to speak their mind, whatever they may have on their mind, and to engage in an ongoing conversation with customers. 
Adams was voted by the public as Brewery of the Year in 2011. Don't make it dull. It's, uh, it's really hard in sustainability to uh, get away from the old lexicon of more efficient or better for you, snore. Sustainability can be sexy. Tesla found this. Tesla is really a battery development company, but they built one hot car to demonstrate their batteries. Or Method, the company that has committed to have its bottles be made of 100% recycled plastic, 25% of it sourced from the oceans. Whenever I tell this story, young people are inspired that a company would have its employees going along the beaches picking up waste and turning it into the plastic for their bottles. New Belgium Brewery is, uh, is one of the best. They, uh, they're definitely making it sexy. Make it relevant. Companies have long had good corporate social responsibility programs, citizenship programs, in which their employees go out and clean up the neighborhood or help with a youth camp. If the program, however, is completely unrelated to what it is you do for a living, it tends to confuse the brand. So for example, uh, here's a shoe company planting a tree. Now there's nothing wrong with planting trees, but it might be better if they focused on what it is that their shoe was enabling people to do. For example, Nike, the classic of we'll reclaim old shoes, take the rubber and turn it into paving at, uh, at parks, basketball courts. This links what it is that Nike is trying to do of its core brand promise around fitness and engagement and involvement with the product that it's selling. Johnson & Johnson is one of the companies that has done the best at this. Uh, the Earthwards program ties the branding of its products to the company's pledge of providing a healthy future. And if the technology gods are kind to us, we're going to bring Al Iannuzzi on board Al is one of the key environmental health and safety leaders in industry. He has over 30 years history in industry, consulting, and government. He's an author of a book on green marketing that I think he will tell you a bit about. He has been one of the key EHS leaders at Johnson & Johnson, which is a company noted for its corporate citizenship. Currently, Al is leading J&J's Product Stewardship and Green Marketing Initiative. He pro previously led a technical group addressing product stewardship, eh &S training, environmental and occupational toxicology, and industrial hygiene. He led the department uh, that set forth J&J's Healthy Planet Goals, uh, helped design the environmental program, the Environmental Training Institute, talent management, and certified assurance programs. Al, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, Come on aboard I'll... and we'll advance your slides for you. Thank you very much, Hunter. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to share this with everyone. Uh, I apologize if um, the audio is not good. Um, I live in New Jersey and um, I've been affected by the uh, hurricane and uh, don't, do not have internet access. The only thing I have working is my cell phone, which I'm pulling in right now. So um, hopefully uh, we'll, we won't have uh, any disconnections. But I'm going to do my best to get us through this, uh, this deck. Um, so if you can hear me, um, we can move to the, uh, the first slide, which is the overview. Still um, able to hear me all right? Uh, 
Hello? Yes, Al, we've got you. Go ahead. Okay. We have your agenda okay. slide up. All right. I'm just going to just going to go through and I'm going to assume that that you can hear me. Uh, so um, what I plan to cover today is a little overview of the J&J sustainability program. I'll talk a little bit about the case for greener products uh, and life cycle, life cycle thinking. Um, speak about our earthwards process, which uh, Hunter alluded to, and then um, a little on uh, green marketing and then wrap it up. So if you go to the next slide, just briefly to see, you know, the size of Johnson & Johnson. We're a very big company, um, sales of $65 billion last year. Um, we have over 250 operating companies, and uh, we operate in um, all regions of the world. I think we're in over 60 countries. So if you go to the next slide, a little shot of our types of products. So it's interesting to know that we have three uh, main divisions. Most people think of us as the... Uh, consumer products, baby powder, or band-aids type of company. That's actually our smallest uh, division, but we also sell um, uh, surgical equipment, medical devices, uh, over-the-counter, and prescription drugs. So uh, when I speak about our uh, product stewardship programs, it covers the whole enterprise, and that's what my responsibilities are, are for. So if you move on uh, to the next slide, I just wanted to show you a little bit about our uh, sustainability heritage. Um, we're very fortunate in that we had a uh, instrumental uh, person, Robert Wood Johnson, who is very uh, forward-thinking. Uh, he uh, was writing about sustainability actually back in the 1940s. You can see this quote over here, and I bold-faced a couple of the uh, key points that he was making in, in the book for Forfeit Free. Basically, the book, um, the premise of the book is that companies need to, to be doing good in in order to um, uh, benefit society and that we need to be aware of um, the materials that we use, not to overuse things, to so control pollution and uh, it says that business basically demands uh, for us to be uh, adding uh, social good through through our, our selling of products. Um, on the very bottom you can see a timeline. Uh, so our first public facing sustainability goals were in 1990 and um, we had goals that looked at like reducing our footprint and uh, energy use and packaging and things like that. And then we started moving into a five-year business rhythm of our goals. Uh, you could see um, in 2005, 10, and now we're, we're in our current set of goals, which are our Healthy Future 2015 goals. So um, the key message here is that we've been fortunate to have sustainability built into our uh, DNA. It's actually built into our, our credo, which is um, the operating document that we use for uh, guiding our, our company. And now on the next slide is just a high level view of our sustainability goals. I thought it would, you would be interested to see this. So uh, we look at sustainability similar to um, people at Profit Planet. We have uh, healthy people goals, healthy planet goals, and healthy business goals. Um, and the only point I want to make here is that our goals now have gotten so broad because when we're looked at from a sustainability perspective, it's not just, you know, environmental issues. It's much, much broader than that. And we have goals around making our life-saving uh, medicines available to people who can't afford it, uh, trying to build capacity in countries on, on health care since we're the largest healthcare company in the world, and partnering with uh, organizations that are um, – have the same mindset as us and can help us deliver on our healthy future goals. Now, if you move on to the next slide, um, Hunter mentioned this book that I authored, uh, Greener Products. Um, this book, uh, it's a pretty new book. It just came out um, at the end of last year. And um, I uh, just wanted to show you a couple of uh, the next slide kind of gets into uh, some of the concepts in the book and the case for greener products. So if you just see, just think about um, China and India and the middle class growing there and the amount of resources that are going to be necessary to provide them with um, the products that we all enjoy here in, uh, in the United States and in developed nations. Uh, where is all those raw materials going to come from? Uh, if you look at some of the stats here from the McKenzie report, you know, this is a major consultant that our bar manager pays a lot of attention to. They're saying that there's going to be a resource um, constraint in the future. So, um, regardless of uh, what your point of view is, I, I think you, just by thinking of that, you, you realize that we're going to have to do things differently when it comes to products. Now, the next slide is uh, uh, some statistics from a uh, book called The Story of Stuff, and there's a video, too, online. If you've never seen it, it's a cute little video that kind of gets through life cycle 
analysis and thinking, and but it makes the case that we we generate a lot of waste in the United States. And um, it, imagine if um, other countries uh, get up to the level we are, especially look at China and India. Again, think about them. Again, where is all this all this material is going to come from to provide the products that they want? You know, I could tell you um, visited China several times, and uh, just visiting some of our manufacturing sites. I mean, hardly any of the employees uh, have automobiles, but that's going to be changing, and it is changing. And you know, that's just one one area. Um, if, if they start having all the amount of automobiles that we have, and all of the electronics, and I mean, the energy use, the materials use, where is that that all going to come from? Uh, things have to be done differently. So that's really. Uh, some of the concepts on the case for greener products. Now the next slide, um, you can see um, to me biggest um, driver for greener products uh, is when our customers are asking for uh, products. So Walmart is our largest customer in the world. We also sell to Tesco and you uh, asking for greener products. I mean when your customers uh, ask, it just enables us to um, to really catalyze more greener product development through through our management teams because it's a customer demand and we're all about trying to meet customer demands. Also, the second bullet refers to our hospital customers. Now, we sell a lot of our products to hospitals um, and we're seeing just about in every request for a proposal um, questions on sustainability and asking, do you have these uh, materials of concern in your products like, like um, heavy metals or bromine? Retardants um, or uh, latex or PVC, and they want to know uh, what you're doing to your energy use and greenhouse gases, and and it's all part of getting to become more and more part of the vision. Um, and then you see some of these uh, funds that were rated on, and the whole idea of life cycle thinking. So this is all, you know, some of the concepts that are in my book and a very uh, early part of my book, just making a case for for greener products. I go into case studies at what leading on how to make uh, greener products and how to market greener products, including what my company, Johnson & Johnson, is doing. So uh, whenever I talk about greener products, if you, if you move on to the next slide, I like to say there's no such thing as a green product. And, um, you know, how does that make you feel? Uh, because we all think, oh, yes, uh, green pro greener green products. So I use the term greener products because every product has a footprint. So the next slide is kind of a slide that builds. I don't know if all the... the uh, parts come up, but if you could just um, open up all of the uh, the builds there, if it's building on, on your uh, slide. But if you think about the greenest product in your mind, um, and think about, um, it, it takes raw materials to, to, to make that. Where, where are those raw materials coming from? You know, it could be agricultural, it could be petroleum. Then they got to be manufactured, and then further manufactured. There's energy, there's waste, there's transportation costs. Uh, then uh, when you move on into the use phase, you know, there, there's, there's waste that, uh, generated, again, more energy use, sometimes water use. And then uh, at the end of its life, uh, hopefully it'll get recycled, but if not, it might have to go to landfill and be incinerated. So every product has uh, a footprint, and every product's footprint can be improved. Likewise, um, uh, you know, the, there, that's why I say there's no such thing as a green product, because every product has a footprint, and it, it takes resources, it takes energy, and there's waste involved in bringing any product or service to market. So uh, what I always focus on is making your products greener. So the next part of this is like um, what Hunter alluded to, a lot of companies don't like to uh, speak about their um, what they're doing, and we kind of came to the realization when we, we started our Earthwards process that we got to start uh, communicating about this more to our customers so they know we're doing this because if you don't talk about it, they assume you're doing nothing. So the, that slide that says, what good is a greener product if no one knows about it, um, that's uh, very true. But if you are going to communicate, as you heard in the intro, you have to do it appropriately. So on, on the next slide, these are the three keys that I've seen from studying leading companies uh, when I wrote my book. Um, I looked at um, what I would consider benchmark companies, and uh, the way that that you, the best uh, ways to tell the story is to have a credible greener product story. So there has to be scientific facts and data behind any claim you're going to bring, and then uh, the the most successful programs meet the customer's um, greener product demands. Uh, so if you look at like let's say like GE's Echo Imagination program, I mean they're looking at reducing energy and water. Um, that's what a lot of their customers are looking for with their type of products, and that's the type of things that that really resonate with your customers. And on, on top of that, it saves them money. And then finally, you need to appropriately communicate uh, the product's greener attributes. 
uh, on it, you see the way how do you communicate? Well, it depends on, on what um, sector uh, or segment of the of your customers that you're going to speak to. So this slide comes from uh, Shelton Group, which is a um, a green marketing uh, company. Uh, they do a lot of research, and they they break them out into four different uh, segments. And uh, different uh, firms have different ways of looking at this. Uh, so if you if you look at each of these segments, uh, so moving on to the next one, uh, the active which would be more the greener type customers, they're interested in uh, purchasing greener products. So you have to message accordingly to them. So they'll even uh, look at reading the labels, and that's the type of people. And they would choose the environment over their personal comfort. So they're really dark green consumers. Uh, and then on to the next one. Um, so what kind of message do you do you bring to them? Well, a message of harmony, health, and uh, they they like those type of messages but they don't like it. it's your duty or this will save you money because typically these actives are, are more affluent so if you're messaging to them you have to message differently again everything's based on fat and then um, moving on to the next uh, slide you could see uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, greenwashing or the seven sins of greenwashing which Tara Choice wrote but you could see them listed here but if you go to the, the very bottom bullet this is the ones that they've seen that were used the most by marketers. So I usually say whenever you work with marketers, I watch out for marketers gone wild because uh, marketers, that's what they do. They, they're great at marketing. They're great at uh, trying to sell their products, but they, they have to um, do it within certain constraints. You know, So uh, th what they're calling the sin of no proof, not having enough documentation or, or a vagueness, uh, you know, it's just saying something is eco-friendly without describing, well, what's the benefit? Why is it eco-friendly? I don't even think you can use those terms anymore under the new FTC guide. And then uh, having false labels. So some companies have gotten implicated by putting their own label on it when it w making it where people have thought that it was a third party uh, approved logo when it, indeed it was not so uh, that's that's why you have to watch out for these type of things so now let's move on to earthwards um, so this is our process um, if you go on to the next slide basically um, earthwards is our process products greener so we have two two objectives one is to develop more uh, greener products, and, and um, in doing that, trying to make it easy for our uh, R&D and marketing people to understand how to do that. The second one is to have um, credible green marketing claims. So we want to; those are our two key objectives. Now, on uh, the next slide here, you can see we have seven key focus areas to make your product greener. So materials, packaging, energy, etc. Um, and we use these icons to describe internally and both externally on how we can make the product and how we have made the product greener. So in materials, uh, for example, you know, you could use uh, less materials, you know, dematerialization, which is a great concept, or you can use more sustainable materials, like using post-consumer recycle content or perhaps basic. Um, or removing materials of concern, for example, um, like we've, we've eliminated over 3,000 tons of PVC from our packaging. So that's an example of how we've made our packaging greener by uh, using more environmentally friendly uh, materials. Now, um, moving on, you can see we have a, a four-step uh, process, and I'm going to take you through that quickly. So step one is uh, satisfying our prerequisites. So um, there's a couple of key concepts that we, we want to get across. Uh, understanding everything that's in your product. Um, that's really easy for shampoos and pharmaceuticals, but not so easy from an uh, electronic medical device. Uh, think of a, a device like the size of a copy machine, thousands of parts, uh, very complicated supply chains. It's really hard to understand every single thing that's in that device. So, But that's the direction that we're going in, and that's part of our prerequisites. We also have like a watch list of materials that are being pressured, and we want um, each uh, individual uh, brand team to do a risk assessment against those that watch list of materials that are being pressured. Now, these are materials that are allowed to be used legally, but are being pressured externally by NGOs and, and uh, some government organizations. Uh, and we also want to see you talk about sourcing level. Well, um, is there any risk in the sourcing chain? What about if you're using, like, say, palm oil or any paper products? Are they coming from sustainably sourced material, uh, raw materials, or not? Now, um, step two 
is doing a life cycle screen. So what you want to do is, is help our um, R&D people and marketing people to understand where are the hot spots, the biggest uh, impact areas of our products. So is it coming from you know the use phase or is it the packaging or is it the raw materials? And so we have a, a bunch of questions that will lead them into that so they can understand where to focus their improvement efforts. Um, now the next uh, slide is just a, shows a hot spot analysis of a, a consumer product and any product that uses hot water, typically the biggest um, impact area will be in the use phase uh, then let's say like a shampoo. Um, so if you can get your customers to take shorter showers or to turn down temperature and hot water heater, that'll save a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, and then you can see also here end of life is, a, is another focus area that will be the biggest impact area. So that's where we want people to focus their improvements. And then uh, uh, the next step is where we're, our objectives is to try to have three ten percent improvements uh, from the previous generation of the product uh, across those seven categories. So uh, focusing on the the most uh, impactful areas, such as the the slide before that. Um, and then if you've made these, uh, we would uh, call your product an Earthwards recognized product. Uh, this is an internal recognition. Um, we have a board that would uh, look at. Um, whether you are uh, you've met all the criteria, including the 10%, three 10% improvements, and on our board we have internal experts as well as uh, some NGOs. Uh, we have someone from the World Wildlife Fund and Practice Green Health on our board. And, and the next slide is a is a high level view of our scorecard. Um, so you could see how we kind of break it up with the type of questions that we ask in the prerequisites uh, phase and the type of objectives that we have for uh, some of our categories. Um, so uh, one of the keys to um, these type of programs is having good uh, uh, third party to help you to develop it, which we use, but also um, the next slide shows you that our, our process is audited annual by a UL environment. Uh, just to give us an, an added uh, benefit um, review to make sure that you know we're following our process appropriately and let our customers know that um, you know we take this seriously and that greener products indeed are coming out of our earthwards process and um, the next slide is just to shows an example of uh, one of our, our greener products which is a, a blood uh, glucose analyzer and you can see the type of uh, icons that we use to communicate that and um, we're using less materials or using post-consumer recycled content or removing materials of concern. And the next slide is a pharmaceutical. Uh, here we have uh, used to ship these pharmaceuticals cold chain in a styrofoam container with gel packs and now we went to reusable containers. Uh, so that's a good way to reduce uh, the um, amount of waste that a, that a customer has to handle. And finally, uh, Neutrogena Natural, which is which does I think a pretty good job of, um, of green communications. Uh, here um, uh, post-consumer recycled content in our in our pack, uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gases, and, and they have a close marketing relationship with the Nature Conservancy. Whenever you purchase that product, you'll be helping the Nature Conservancy, and you can see this if you go online to uh, Neutrogena Naturals. Um, this is uh, the the next slide is just a, a snapshot of a couple of our products, and then if you go to the um, uh, slide that says making greener products, um, so this is just a high level. Um, the, the best practices that uh, we see, um, th that I've seen in doing the analysis uh, through through my book, um, what are the keys to um, to these uh, leading greener product development, and top management support, third party input, um, you know, an NGO or, or a consultant, um, using scorecards of focal areas, having enterprise wide goals as well as a greener product development process, use of life cycle analysis. And we're seeing more companies uh, putting transparency information on their ingredients out there, as well as um, trying to address their customers' concerns. And then uh, um, the next to last slide uh, would be green marketing best practices I've seen through through the analysis, the case studies that I looked at. You know, again, the best programs effectively communicate by meeting their customers' needs. Also, um, the customers trust third-party endorsements, so you party respected echo logos um, and then uh, branding uh, greener product brand lines like um, our earthwards line we're seeing more and more of uh, companies moving to that type of uh, 
the concept uh, use of co appropriate cause marketing that ties into the, cost, the the product and the essence of the product, and then finally being authentic by not overstating uh, the green attributes of your product. So that's pretty much what I wanted to share. I hope you guys could hear could have hear me all right. Um, um, uh, the next slide is just the shot on the cover of my book, and then the last slide is just my contact information. If anybody wants to reach out uh, after this webinar, feel free to email me, um, and I'll be happy to communicate with you. Thank you very much. Al, thank you so much, and thanks so much for being with us despite having come through the worst hurricane uh, that has ever hit the U.S. I'm very glad to hear your voice and to know that you're all right. And we'll be making these slides available. They will be on the Natural Capitalism website, www.natcap.org. And we'll, uh, we'll put these up for you. I'm pleased now to introduce my friend Nick Astor. Nick is the founder of Triple Pundit which is one of the world's most read websites on responsible business. He's a new media architect specializing in using online technology to advance conversations on sustainability. Most recently, he helped Mother Jones Magazine relaunch the magazine's online presence. He's worked with such companies as Nike, SAP, Gawker Media, many others on internal and external strategies for communication. For many years he worked at Treehugger, the most popular environmental website in the world. He holds an MBA in Sustainable Management from Presidio School of Management and a BA in History from Washington University. Nick, glad to have you with us. Okay, hold. Hang on. Uh, uh, Nick. There we go. Uh, Nick, you're with us now. Go ahead, please. Okay, great. Hunter, thanks for the gracious introduction. Um, it's good to be here. And um, in the interest of, of time and in the spirit of social media, which is what I'm going to be talking briefly about, um, I'm going to hustle through my slides a little bit more quickly so that we can have plenty of time for Q&A. And for that matter, if folks want to stick around for a few minutes later uh, and get into more detail with some of the examples I'm going to lay out, um, that's fine with me as long as it's fine with the organizers. So um, so let's just jump into it. Um, Al's last slide uh, left us with this idea of authenticity. Authenticity was also a theme that um, you mentioned, Hunter, uh, in, uh, in, in, in your introduction. And to me, authenticity is sort of that uh, silver bullet that we're all looking for when we're out there communicating in general and in particular with regards to uh, the thing we call social media. Um, we call ourselves a media platform for the conversation on sustainable business. Uh, it's a conversation that in our case is taking place almost entirely on social media. Um, we use the term conversation very deliberately because we consider um, all of business to be essentially a conversation. Any type of interaction, buying and selling, uh, that you're doing with somebody is ultimately coming down to a human conversation. Uh, the idea of markets as conversation is a quote from a, a sort of a famous web guru named Doc Searles who wrote something called the Clue Train Manifesto, uh, which is worth Googling if you're interested in some of the history behind uh, social media. And uh, as the slide goes, um, let's define it just a little bit. Um, the reason social media is so revolutionary primarily is because there's no barrier to entry. It's a free form of publishing. Literally anybody can enter this conversation, whether they are a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist or a six-year-old kid. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, positives and negatives to that, um, but at the end of the day, that's what it is, and it happens to be revolutionary, in my opinion. It's inherently networked. Any Thing you say online can be commented on, reposted, um, built upon, uh, and whether you intend it to be conversational or not, it is conversational. Um, and whether you intend it to be transparent or not, uh, you're going to be uh, called on that. You're going to be, um, you're going to be the, 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 the nature of social media is such that it's going to enforce transparency, basically, whether you like it or not. Um, as I mentioned,
mentioned, um, why should we care? Well, really, you don't have a choice. It's happening anyway. And one of the um, – there's a, a quote, which uh, I think I knocked out of the slide here from Jeffrey Hollander, who is one of the – who was the founder of Seventh Generation. Uh, and to paraphrase it, he says, and I concur, that the, the, the reality of what we might call – the conversation on, on sustainability or even CSR 2.0, if you will, or even communications in this era of social media is that your brand is decreasingly under your control and increasingly under the control of this unorganized, disruly mob of people out there on the Internet. And uh, there's not a lot you can do about it, so you have to find out how to participate in it wisely um, and figure out how to walk that line between conservatively keeping your mouth shut and, and risking that other people are going to fill in the blanks of the conversation uh, for you or whether or not you're going to open up and communicate and, of course, then run the risk of, uh, of being called out as a greenwasher if you don't do it right. And this is a really, uh, really, you know, this conversation goes way beyond sustainability and it's about corporate communications in general, uh, but it's particularly important for sustainability because this is a topic that people hold um, with particular criticism and, um, and care and, and it's something that, that, the, that the people out there leading this conversation feel very strongly about and are going to go out of their way to call you on or hopefully reward you for uh, if you don't do it right. So let's just roll down uh, seven tips. Uh, we've already talked about this idea of, of uh, be real, be authentic. Um, is the slide going? There we go. Um, a bunch of different examples uh, uh, that we can get, get more into. Um, McDonald's uh, had a notorious um, experience where they tried to create a a phony website about a kid that discovered a French fry shaped like Abraham Lincoln. This was one of the most ridiculous ideas in the history of social media. It blew up in McDonald's face. They were called up for being, for being fake, and it cost them a lot of credibility. Southwest, on the other hand, has done a phenomenal job of putting a real human being, in fact, there's a whole group of them, uh, who are manning their Twitter feed and some of the other social media um, interfaces that the company works on to answer uh, basic customer service questions all the way up to some of the headier uh, questions on sustainability itself, um, biofuels, and some of the specific things that folks in our uh, neck of the woods are uh, caring about, um, and has always done so openly and, uh, and very um, rapidly and quickly and never hidden behind some kind of uh, fake gimmick like that, and as a result, it's paid off very well for them. Um, and, uh, and uh, the second point, add value. Uh, these are some more advanced tools that some companies have used. Um, the idea of in enabling your CSR report to be something more than a, um, a, a PDF, something that's actually happening online, uh, that is comments enabled, and is, is um, an interactive uh, social media enabled experience rather than just a one-way sense of communication. A couple other companies, Patagonia and Icebreak, have done some phenomenal work online to create some, uh, some uh, tools that you can use to get really deep down into the supply chain of those two companies. This is the kind of thing that adds a huge amount of value to the basic conversation that's taking place out there about the efforts of those particular companies. Um, this idea of setting it free, which Hunter actually alluded to earlier, uh, this is one of the single most powerful things. Uh, to go back to Southwest Airlines uh, uh, and uh, another company, FedEx, and another company, Recycle Bank, all three of whom I had a great conversation with last week at the Net Impact Conference. Um, all three of those companies and, and uh, the companies on the slide here, Virgin Atlantic in particular, have an official voice of the company, an official Twitter account, an official Facebook page, um, et cetera. Uh, and they have a team of folks that are managing those interfaces, but they also have employees who um, have, for whatever reason, uh, become um, recognized as basically um, evangelists for those companies and who have been encouraged and um, to participate in the online media conversation representing those companies. 
And these people have actually managed to build a little bit of a name for themselves and a little bit of a following for themselves out there online. And the company has realized, you know, it is actually to our benefit to have these folks out there. Um, we trust them uh, to represent the company. There's maybe a certain set of ground rules that have been kind of agreed upon in terms of how they go out and do that. But for the most part, they're free to go out there, uh, interact with people as if they were having a conversation with somebody on the street, um, uh, answer basic questions about the company, refer uh, more complicated questions when necessary. Um, but basically, to go out there and, and, and represent the company, which is a really powerful way of, um, of uh, interacting with customers. Um, all three of those companies told me that having those employees who are out there managing Twitter, for example, saves the company time and, and labor because somebody on Twitter can actually attend to uh, more customer questions and more customer complaints in a faster and more effective manner than folks manning a call center. At this point in time, they all still have call centers because it's going to be necessary for the foreseeable future to do that. Um, but if you can save time and labor by having reliable people handling basic customer service uh, requests via something like Twitter, um, you're going to come out ahead. Um, another tenet, of course, is don't ignore it. Um, one of the classic examples is the famous kryptonite lock example, which took place in the early days of social media, about six years ago, uh, someone figured out you could hack one of these with a big pen, and uh, the blogosphere uh, went, uh, went berserk about it. The um, company was badly called out. The company paranoically remained silent for about five days uh, while people panicked and uh, threw away their kryptonite locks, ran off, bought new locks, and only after quite a few days did they sort of put out a relatively meek uh, press release stating, okay, we're aware of the problem and we're trying to deal with this. Whereas if they had just jumped out and said, wow, this is a big deal, you know, we acknowledge it, we're working on it, even a simple one-liner would have saved them uh, a ton of lost customers. And, of course, uh, make sure you don't want to have, um, you do have to have at least some uh, monitoring of who you have representing the company. One of the most recent examples, uh, KitchenAid had an unfortunate incident during the debates where one of their, um, one of the people managing their Twitter account uh, got a little out of line uh, with one of the political candidates. Uh, we don't know if that person was fired or not, but it's very likely that they were. Um, caused the company a great deal of headache. Uh, it's happened with other companies as well. At the end of the day, just don't fake it. If you don't know, this is really just the sort of the number one kind of uh, uh, takeaway, in my opinion, is if you don't know what you're doing, admit that you don't know what you're doing. Um, do it in a clever, funny way if you like, but just don't try to fake it because it's almost guaranteed to come back and blow up in your face. And I ran through that quickly. Uh, there's a lot more um, specific examples, and we can get into some more, some more uh, specific details, but... Uh, since we're running out of time, I thought we'd, we'd do that, and um, I'll be here for a little bit uh, after to keep, uh, keep the conversation rolling. Nick, thank you. That was great. And as Nick said, he'll hang around. I'll be here. Uh, Al, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Oh, excellent. If any of you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box at the bottom of the interface of your webinar and we'll uh, we'll take them as, uh, as long as people want to keep asking them. The first question that we've gotten is how do you evaluate your marketing program? How do you ensure that you're not greenwashing and particularly that you're not at risk of the FTC coming uh, snooping around you? The answer to that that I would say is as Nick said, be authentic, be transparent, admit it if you have flaws and state that you're working on it and how. If you're unsure about what you're doing, bring in a third party evaluator, as, uh, as Al was saying, bring in a peer, bring in somebody from the industry. This is the sort of service that natural capitalism provides for a number of companies. 
But Al, how would you answer that question? You guys bring in a lot of third-party evaluators. Yeah, well, I would say that our, our best insulator against um, greenwashing is our Earthwards process. Um, so we built um, enough of checks and balances in there uh, to that, that the whole idea is that if a brand team goes through this whole process and, and has um, uh, claims that come out of it, that they know that these claims will not be greenwashing, that they will be scientifically based. And we have, you know, even third parties involved in on our board and a third party review of the process too. So that like the time an example for the FTC green guys, like we're going to be doing special training on our mar for our marketers too, uh, through like webinars, you know, webinars. Now, question we got, how is J&J &J remaining price competitive with their green products? Yeah, um, well, actually, we, some of our, pro our products um, are uh, like in consumer products around like the Neutrogena Naturals and our Johnson Naturals line are like, uh, the only products that are, have um, these type of ingredients that are uh, available to the masses. So uh, most of the products that people will, will buy in those are much more expensive. So we're trying to keep our raw material costs down by uh, being innovative and developing newer uh, raw materials. But I, I kind of, and the way, the message we give our management team is that uh, sustainability and, and greener products is an end. It's not uh, something that you can get a price premium for. So what I mean by an end is that the product has to meet its, the quality that, that the customer is looking for. It has to uh, effectively operate and it has to be greener. Um, so uh, we cannot uh, expect to get price premium for greener products. We're looking at greener products as a, a differentiator. If our product functions as well as a, as a competitor and our, and our product is greener, we believe we will win the sale. So that's really um, the kind of message that we're seeing in, across all of our business segments, including the consumer product segment too. For both Al and Nick, What's the most effective way of building support of getting buy-in amongst senior management? I'll let Nick go first since I was talking already. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a tough one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll cop out and tell you that without buy-in from senior management, you can forget about a whole lot happening. Um, so it's definitely something to... Um, to prioritize. I think to a certain extent you can have grassroots efforts pay off, but at the end of the day without, um, you know, a CEO that's really into this, um, you know, you can really only get so far. Um, so, but the simple answer is to, number one, you know, keep at it and keep discussing it whenever you have the opportunity to, but number two, also to build a very sound business case for this kind of thing. Um, and if that's you know, some of using some of the communication and marketing uh, tools and techniques that you know both all three of us have been talking about today. That's certainly part of it. Um, but if it's only a matter of this is going to save money uh, because it's more energy or efficient or whatever, uh, that's certainly a fine place to start. Yeah, I, I, I would um, I would say that. Um, the way that we've done it is uh, through our customers. So uh, when, as the point I made earlier, uh, when your customers are asking for greener products, um, that's going to catch management's attention. And so what we've done is try to capture that that information through collecting voice of the customer data. Uh, we just sponsored a, a major survey, a global survey, uh, which anybody could download regarding our hospitals. Um, so we researched our customers uh, throughout the, the world, and including the United States and Brazil, I think Italy, um, and several, several countries. And we, we collected this data. We put together a report. We actually made the report public, so that's what you can get at earthwords.com. Uh, but uh, that helps to build the business case. The more that we can show customers are asking for these things and the more we can show uh, it being a differentiator or a risk of not addressing it, then uh, we, we have an easier job, much easier job of building the business case. Two resources that people might want to take a look at. Bob Willard has a book called The Next Sustainability Wave, Getting Boardroom Buy-In. On, the, on a process that you can use of having this conversation with senior management. 
You might also check out a short video called Social Media Revolution that is available on YouTube that gives some statistics about the spread of social media and if you're, how if you're not in the conversation. It's the old saying, if uh, you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. Al, um, how would you apply these product principles to a service company? Yeah, um, no, so we're, we're not a service company, so I'm just going to do this off the top of my head here. I haven't really thought about it in a lot of detail, but I know, um, like in my book, um, some of the companies that I studied did ha do service. GE Echo Imagination applies to all their business units, including uh, GE Capital. So, um, uh, Al, you still with us? We we lose. Yeah, again. can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. I guess you might not have heard what I said up there. So, what I what I was saying is that what you could do is you could footprint your service. You know, where are, where are your biggest impacts, and then um, look at. Uh, ways to reduce your impacts uh, in that regards, but um, if you're looking at you know social issues as well, what, it depends on the service that that you're providing. But having something that that your customers are looking for, tying it into your service model as well, so they get sort of an extra benefit by going with your company. Those are the type of things I would be looking at. So trying to minimize your footprint and understanding that better, and connecting a social benefit to your customers. Nick, you are a service company. How do you apply these principles to what it is that you do? Well, we're, it's a little bit of a tricky answer to us because, you know, we're, we're sort of a service company. I mean, we're really a media company, so we're talking about this kind of thing all the time and always looking for interesting stories. Um, if it did come down to, you know, communicating with, with folks about our own strategies and, and so on, you know, I'd like to say that we're so deep into the conversation that that it that it's kind of uh, it kind of comes natural for us. Um, but as far as if I if I were to answer, you know, for a service company, and, and this is based on some of the conversations I've had uh, fairly recently, um, you know, a customer facing company is always involved in constant conversations with you know people that love you, people that hate you, people that just have basic questions, and so on. And so from the perspective of social media, you know, A, this is a potentially opportunity to save a lot of labor uh, and save a lot of effort because you can, uh, if, you, if you're clever with how you design, you know, uh, answers to frequently asked questions, if you're clever uh, with how you, um, you know, publicly respond to major problems that other people may have, uh, you can earn a lot of credibility, you can make your customers happy more quickly with less effort. Um, and uh, you can potentially solve a lot of problems. And the same goes for, you know, when things go wrong. Um, you know, you have to be extra, extra uh, aware that, you know, you've got a lot more people than, say, a B2B company who are sitting around paying attention to you. And um, I guess the last thing I would say is that it's really important to find out and put a little bit of extra effort into two particular groups, the super critics and the super fans. Um, probably 5 or 10% of the people that pay attention to your company would fall into either of those two groups. Um, and those are the kind of people that you can usually identify uh, just by, you know, watching the social media stream out there. But you can also employ all kinds of different tools to figure out, you know, what individuals are constantly talking about you. Are they saying good things? Are they saying bad things? Put a little bit of extra effort into dealing with those people. Um, because A, you know, you have to, because otherwise they won't shut up. But B, because those are the kind of people that are going to spread the word about your company tenfold, a hundredfold, more than the average person. So if you treat them well, uh, it has a, 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 a tremendous magnifying effect. Nick, um, a question came in. Do you track your carbon footprint? You know, at Natural Capitalism, we're, we offset all of our carbon footprint because we were early members of Chicago Climate Exchange. But uh, what does Triple Pundit do? We do actually. Um, Jen's in charge of that. Uh, so I don't know who we're using right now, but we do. Um, 
you know, our carbon footprint is, is happens to be pretty minimal, and we've got a website, and we take a few flights, um, and so it's not a, it's not a great comparison to you know what a larger company's challenges might be. But we do write it down, uh, and um, and we do offset it. Al, a question: How does J and J leverage its Green Words program in its consumer communication? Okay, um, so our EarthWords program, I assume, is what, what they're talking about. Oh, yes, so, sorry. okay, no problem. Um, so we EarthWords is an internal process, so we do not put it on pack or anything like that um, because it's it's not a third party uh, Echo logo. But what we will do um, is maybe mention it on some websites, but uh, you know that we have this process because some of our stakeholders are interested in that. But primarily, what we do is we speak about the improvements that have come out of the process. So you know, it does the uh, product contain now uh, the package so let's say post consumer recycled content have re removed some materials of concern from our product for example and those type of things we'll communicate those aspects to the customer not so much you know the the use use of the logo we got a question how would your strategy on marketing and green message be any different if you're targeting internal employees rather than your customer base this is an area that at natural capitalism we work with companies on a lot how do you talk to your employees about the green attributes of what you're doing and how do you empower your employees to be marketers when they're out in the world talking with with everybody that they talk with uh, Nick how would you answer that how do you talk to employees yeah I think I think that's a really good question um, the employees are incredibly important to this because as they you know employees tend to be like that small group of people who really are out there spending time talking about your company and have the potential to really be you know not only evangelists about your company but if employees really care uh, they're going to be happier, you know, they're going to do their job better and, and, and everything else. So at the end of the day, and by the way, a good statistic um, is that, I don't know if it's the single largest group, but it's one of the largest groups who read CSR reports are actually the employees of the, question, of the, of the company in question, um, which people often forget about, but it makes perfect sense. If you're spending all day long working for a company, you probably care about that company. And, or you want to care about that company at least. Um, so, comp so employees are thirsty for that information to begin with, and it's the kind of thing that's going to make them, you know, uh, inspired and everything else. Um, and so, the simple answer is communicate it by means of tailoring perhaps those sustainability reports, your sustainability strategy, um, and whatever product innovation you're working on that has anything to do with 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 this stuff. Uh, specifically to employees, um, inform them that you're going to be making changes, inform them why, inform, ask them why this is important, and build this into a, um, you know, one of the tenets of the mission of your company, if possible, um, in terms of doing the right thing and, uh, you know, leaving a positive legacy as a company. And take it seriously and uh, don't make it fluffy and employees will take it seriously too. This was a topic that we covered in a prior webinar, and you can get that webinar at www.natcapsolutions.org. And let's take one last question. Uh, if any of you still have questions that we haven't been able to get to, uh, feel free to write us at Natural Capitalism, Nick at Triple Pundit, Al at Johnson & Johnson. Al, is there any extended producer responsibility for J and J today, or anyone in healthcare, especially for chemical and chemicals and hazardous materials? Okay, well, I could tell you for within our company, um, we do have objectives, uh, which we've had some of them since our last uh, set of sustainability goals to um, take back um, our. Uh, electronic products and medical products uh, to try to have them remanufactured or recycled. That's one of our objectives. Um, really exciting uh, development was actually through an acquisition that we made in November of last year of a company called Sterilmed based in Minnesota. 
uh, this company's business model is what they do is they take uh, single-use disposable devices that are typically disposed of as red bag waste in hospitals. They take them and they uh, reprocess them. Uh, they remanufacture them and sterilize them and, and sell them back to the hospitals, uh, functioning as, as good as original equipment. And um, at a reduced cost. Therefore, you're reducing waste and, and helping to reduce the cost of healthcare. So that's one of the ways that that we've got at it. Regarding hazardous materials, um, I mean, we don't. There isn't much uh, where you know we're using many hazardous materials in our products themselves. So I can't really speak to that. But I could tell you, you know, the type of things that that we have been. Um, doing such as the electronic take back and I know we're, we're also looking at partnering with packaging take back with um, certain organizations that, that specialize in, in, in that in the United States for example. Thanks and thank you Al, thank you Nick uh, so much for joining us today. These webinars are a service that Natural Capitalism Solutions offers on a periodic basis check in on our website, www.natcapsolutions.org. There you can download this webinar, you can download the previous webinars. You can also check out the wide array of services that we offer to companies, to communities, to countries, to help you implement sustainability in ways that drive your profitability and your prosperity. Thanks so much to all of you for being a part of this webinar, and we look forward to talking to you at our next one. Bye, all.